we all have passions that, that for, you know, it might be a specific patient population. It, it might be wanting to start a practice. It might be wanting to start a podcast. It might be wanting to start a YouTube channel. You, sh- you can and should do all those things, especially if you know that there's a specific person out there that you want to help. Because as physical therapists, we should be good communicators. Don't be afraid because I guarantee you, someone who's really good at it has been afraid too. Um, so Michael, introduce, how do you introduce yourself to people? Like what's your, what's your one or two sentence superhero backstory? Like if you were to try to sum it up, what's, how's it, how's it work? Gosh. Um, well, I guess the simplest thing to say would be, I introduced myself as a doctor of physical therapy, doctor of physical therapy, excuse me. Um, and I am passionate about individuals with Parkinson's disease in particular. I, um, my passion is educating. And so of course, treating patients is what I love to do, but I love to help people understand yeah. uh, not only what they're dealing with, but why we do the things that we do with them um, or, you know, why things are happening that, that are happening to them with their disease process Yeah, um, and why the treatments are working and so forth. I so, feel like, I feel like the phrase patient education came up so many times in PT school, especially towards the end of PT school. Oh, totally. I mean, and, all, ad nauseum. And all over the place with any kind of condition. Well, of course, caregiver education, patient education. And I remember just being like, with every pathology, that was just listed as a treatment. It was like a way to just fill space on the page, right? So you'd say something. And then I realized we didn't do a whole lot of learning in PT school on what that actually meant, how it looked like, and actually practiced it. But you bring right. that up as something that, you know, is is terribly important. And I agree with you. Um, how do you explain that to patients that part of the magic of what you do isn't necessarily how you're touching them, where you're touching them, but what you're telling them. How do you, how do you make sure they understand the context that what's in your brain is actually pretty valuable? Well, you know, I think it starts, it starts with listening because a lot of times you will have a conversation that comes about, in other words, the patient will give you, they'll kind of give you that lead in, um, to show that knowledge. Right. Right. So it it may be an evaluation, maybe a treatment session. Regardless, um, a, a patient will, may, may bring up something that's bothering them or, you know, either a symptom or some, something that may not even, they don't think it's related to what you're doing. But then, you know, in the Parkinson's world, there's so many non-motor symptoms. There's, there's all these interactions with things. And so they might think it's unrelated. It, this is, I'm just using this as an example, but something might come up and you're like, oh, wow, you know, you do know that that could be because of X, Y, Z with Parkinson's or the meds you're taking or this and that and the other. And they're like, oh man, really? You know? And so just, it will come out in that conversation that, oh, this guy's an authority on this stuff. Yeah. It doesn't have to be a, a, an announcement to them of like, hey, look, I'm the, I'm the honcho, the head honcho in this, or the, uh, I'm the guru in this space, you right. know? Right. Um, so, you know, it could be, um, it could be within, you know, within the context of that, that visit. And it, it really, it really positions you as the Yoda, right? Like Yoda never needed to brag about how long he'd been a Jedi or how many bad guys he beat with his lightsaber. Like Yoda just is like, Hey, I see, I see you like uh, Oprah Winfrey. It's funny how Oprah and Yoda sound similar and they're very personas are very similar, right? Cause they're like, <laughs> they're seen as like these masters of their craft. But yeah. Yoda and o- Oprah said that people want to be seen, heard and understood. And I feel like when people yeah. aren't don't feel seen, heard, and understood, they don't buy in, they don't show up. Where we might say patient is non-compliant or person just fails to follow through on anything. Kid kid doesn't engage at school. I'm like, does the person feel like they understand, that they feel seen, heard, heard and understood? And this doesn't mean to coddle people. It means they understand where they, this is like, so. I'm going to use a, a communications term and a physiological term. Do they understand their social proprioception? Do they understand where they fit? Ooh. In this like context. That. And when people do, people work harder, people are engaged, uh, and people show up. Absolutely. That's in a business sense or a patient sense. I, I think it. Social proprioception. I'm going to put that on a t-shirt. I like I, That's a great term. I love it. Um, and uh, yeah, I just, you know, our healthcare system is so, I don't know what the right term is. I want to say fractured or scattered or something along those lines. You know, we've got, we're, we're many parts to this one body of healthcare, but we don't talk to each other. Right. Yeah. So I guess what, I'm, what my stream of consciousness here is 
people will see a physician, let's be it a neurologist or a primary care, probably neurologist in my world, but you know, they, 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 they may not have the time to talk to them in depth about their issues. Or even if they do address some of those issues, they don't, maybe they don't have the most thorough knowledge themselves, especially if they're not like a movement disorder specialist, somebody who's really niche into the Parkinson's MS, all those diagnoses world or that kind of world. So, um, a lot of these physicians don't really know. And so when you, when you have these conversations with folks, sometimes you can see on their, even they might even say this, but you can see it on their face, like, Oh my gosh, you're the first person that really put this together for me. Yeah. You know, and that's kind of a, it's an empowering thing for them. Um, and, um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of what I meant earlier too, uh, alluded to earlier with that, that social proprioception, like yeah. you said, you're, you're, you're making these connections for people um, in your, in your, it doesn't have to be the niche I'm in. It could be anything, any, but it's any, yeah, you've got a great, uh, you got a great nugget of, uh, of wisdom and your nugget of wisdom is that you tell people not to believe in negative self-talk. And this is, this actually has come up. I, I've started to read um, like Ryan Halliday and a lot about stoicism and that's like goes back to like ancient Greek philosophers and like sort of it was, it's not necessarily a religion, really. It's just like a thought process. Yeah. Yeah. And then you, you go further and you say you already know more than you need to be successful yeah. to help people. You could start your own practice if you wanted to. You are already enough to make a difference in people's lives. That's heavy, man. That's deep. Yeah. I feel like that's um, I kind of feel like that's a mistake. A lot of people make like when they're getting out of therapy school or as a new grad, like they think I, I don't have enough knowledge or expertise to, to really make a difference to people, or I don't want to specialize in this, or I don't want to start my own practice yet. I don't feel like I know enough. I'm, I'm guilty of that by the way, but I see that. I, yeah. And you too, I see, I see that. And I'm like, that is just such a, it's a lie that you tell yourself. Um, but you know what, frankly, if I'm looking at myself in the mirror, I'd say, you know what, you told yourself that because you were getting out of your comfort zone um, in trying to to claim that basically claim something as what you wanted to specialize in or that you were you you knew it a lot about that area already when you got out of school. Now believe me, comparing twenty twelve me to twenty twenty four me, right. I know a heck of a lot more about Parkinson's, but um and I've actually had the experience, but um whether it's starting a, a niche practice like that or just starting a practice, period, you definitely know what you need to know. Yeah. I mean, you're going to gain experience. Well, so th that's the idea, right, is there's no ceiling on knowledge. So you can always continue to know more. But what I think, you're, what I think I'm taking away is likely what you do know, the amount that you do know, is enough to clear the floor. You know more yeah. than enough to be of value to people. Have we ever done learning or you know we I, I feel like as a society we our body of knowledge continues to grow so i don't i think that's where that comparison we get we get stuck comparing yeah. ourselves to other people and we're like well yes. I'm not as skilled about all those things as that guy or man that girl's really got a good grasp on that and i don't really feel as, co as confident or competent and then we say i'm not enough and i like the way you phrase it which is like likely you are enough but that's not saying that you shouldn't continue to grow it's like likely you're right. enough to help enough people right now to make a difference in their lives with what you have already hard stop. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, totally. totally. Uh, you, you, you reiterate this too, because you say that you think the population at large, meaning people we can help people, we can treat people, we can make a, an effect and a change in their lives. They're largely tired of being ignored and being moved around where it feels like the great big medical complex or the system that we operate in, like, the, you know, your primary function is to uh, see the person, do some stuff, and then move them along to the next process. And people mm -hmm. hate feeling like a cog in the machine. And I would get tired of that, too, if that's the, the kind of I am tired of that when I feel like I'm part of that medical complex or any part of society. Mm -hmm. um, but with your focus on listening, I feel like that slows the machine down. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> you get you get a sense of what people you just get a sense of everything their struggles their their desires um and frustrations all those things the positive and the negative comes out in those slowing down and listening um and and doesn't necessarily mean that you have to empathize in everything that they say but relating to them and uh, validating what they're feeling is important yeah um 
and I guess I didn't say this earlier, but a thought that occurred to me when we were talking about um, this area was these these folks should feel like they're the hero of their own story. I uh, love the way you phrase that. Hey, where, where are you going with your PT career? That's not rhetorical. I want to know. Would you like to embark on an extraordinary patient care adventure? That's what they call it. Some, some people might call it travel therapy. Find out more at jacksontherapy.com. This is perfect for physical therapists who are eager to make their mark. Discover where your skills can take you at jacksontherapy.com with Jackson Therapy Partners. And here's a question for you. Are you frustrated with your EMR? Feel like it, it should do more, be easier? Yeah. Take the next step. Maybe try something new. How about an EMR that's all in one? Seamless integrations of patient portals, marketing automations, and billing, all at an unbeatable value. Plus, switching over is a breeze. See what you can do with MW Therapy and their all-in-one EMR at mwtherapy.com. And how would you like to boost your bottom line and help more people? You can do both of those things without having to work more. Smarter, not harder, kids. Boost your clinic's revenue by $290 per patient per quarter by adding remote therapeutic monitoring. You've heard about it, but you're like, I don't know where to get started. Is it complicated? Well, what if you knew where to get started and it wasn't complicated? That's what Physiotech is here for. Kickstart your RTM at physiotech.ca. That's physiotech.ca right now with Physiotech. We're talking about the negative self-talk, right? So <clears throat> that's kind of bringing it back to my my population that I work with the most is negative self-talk. Self-talk is really common, and um, and part of that's the disease process as well. It tends to result in uh, depression, apathy, and and so forth. And so, um, real help, helping somebody come around to the to the belief uh, or to recognize that they have a false belief that they can't get better or they won't get better or <clears throat> they don't deserve to get better or whatever it is they're telling themselves. They're the hero of their own story. And so you have to bring that back around and, and sh re show them like, no, no, look, <clears throat> you, you just don't, didn't have somebody to show you what you could do or to show you where you could get if you work on this with therapy or lifestyle change or whatever it might be, um, or to help you understand what you're going through. Um, and so... So yeah, um, I, I, you had said something earlier. I can't remember how you worded it, but it reminded me of that uh, being the hero of your own story statement. Yeah. Um, it's it's like um, you know every every Luke needs their Obi Wan Kenobi, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, Donald Miller. Uh, yeah, is, is build your person. story brand. Build yeah, your story brand. that's exactly where I took it from. Yeah. And then it's yeah. funny how someone like Donald Miller says something, and it's so simple because. It's so prophetic when someone says something like that because you've already known that. He just put words to it. He mm -hmm. just very, very apropos. He put a story to it, to this thing, this idea that you probably already knew and felt, but he was able to communicate it in a story, which is his whole thing. Yeah. And then it resonates and you go, Oh, I knew all the elements. I had all the letters, but you put them together in a certain way. Now I now I can understand it better. Now I can use it. Yeah. The greatest it. compliment somebody can give you is that you made the you made somebody feel better either physically or emotionally better than they were before that you got there. That's a pretty good that's a pretty good grasp on what you'd like to leave behind. I guess if you think yeah. about it like that, every inter interaction is an opportunity for that. I mean, a hundred percent. You you don't know what you're going to get when you walk through the door. Uh, in my case, I do mobile visits, so I'm walking into someone's home or uh, assisted living apartment or whatever. And um, <clears throat> you don't know how their morning has gone or their afternoon or whatever. Um, they may be having a great day. They may be having a not great day. Um, <clears throat> they may be having a good uh, a good day with their mood, but they physically aren't moving very well. Um, or medicine's wearing off early that day. Or maybe the whole day is just crap, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. But the, like you said, to reiterate what you said, the... Um, if I feel like I haven't done my job well, if that person, if something hasn't changed since, since I started to see them that day. And, sure. it, and, I, and like you said, it might be their mood. It might be physically it's better. Um, in the case of Parkinson's disease, you know, there's 
like I said, there's movement symptoms and there's non-movement symptoms, and that includes um, mood issues and uh, depression and so forth. So <clears throat> physical exercise helps all of those things. And so, and again, it may not be both in one day, but you might have both. You might have one or the other as an issue. And so um, after doing those intense exercises that we do, um, specific program I do is LSVT Big, which is specifically designed for Parkinson's. And that is, it's essentially, um, I wouldn't call it exactly a HIIT workout, but it's it's a pretty intense exercise workout right. for somebody who doesn't move well. And, uh, and, and I do the exercises with them. Uh, that's the, that's one thing I think that, that sets that program apart compared to other things we do in therapy is I'm actually doing it with the patient the entire time. So I'm modeling the exercises, I'm cueing them, I'm doing all that, um, showing them how big they need to move. Um, and so, and in that, <clears throat> I lost my train of thought in that you're modeling um, the behavior. Yeah. You're modeling the behavior. Exactly. And, and your the affect even is something you're modeling. So, you know, they may have a more of a, the stereotypical thing you hear about is masked face, but even if they don't have a masked face, like that true, like, you know, like stone face look, even if they don't have that look, they may have an, they just may be a little muted in their mood or, or whatever. And when you're doing these exercises with them, it's to have my game face on literally. I mean, I'm, you know, like, I'm not literally like, like this, like looking creepy, but you know, like, I'm, I'm like stepping forward big and wide eyes, big you, expression. Know, you know, expression, bright face, you know, <clears throat> and you'll see that mirrored. It's really a kind of an amazing thing. You, you know, you probably heard as a PT, you've heard of the mirror neurons kind of thing. Um, there, there really is something to that. I mean, your little, little kids pick up on stuff that grownups do, and that's built into us innately. And so it, it doesn't go away just because you're a grownup. Right. Um, so you see somebody, you know, smiling, a nice countenance, and you tend to mirror that back. You see someone who's kind of dour and you mirror tend to be serious, right? So, um, you know, again, it's not exaggerated because I, I, I feel like it is um, – it's an authentic thing I'm feeling, but, but at the same time, if, even if I'm having a bad day, I have to make sure I have a high energy for them. Yeah. So uh, all the, I'm sorry, I'm getting off topic, but that's it. it at the end of the day, okay. that, that should make a change in their, yeah. in their day. Yeah. Uh, Michael, we'd like to do something called 60 second PT. Are yeah. you ready to do t 60 second PT? I am ready. I've been preparing. Right. It's, the <laughs> fastest, it's the fastest minute in physical therapy. Your 60 second PT. <laughs> starts right now. Michael, define physical therapy in just three words. Humbling, rewarding, frustrating. What's the most challenging part of your job? I'd say it's balancing what you know is best for the client with what's considered medically necessary by the powers that be. What's the most rewarding part of your job? I'd say the most rewarding part is making somebody smile who didn't have hope before. What's a myth about PT that you often encounter? Oh gosh, um, that you need permission from your doctor to get physical therapy. Oh, that's a big one. What's a common mistake that new physical therapists make? Not believing that they have enough knowledge to make a difference in their patient's world right now. What's a trend in physical therapy that excites you the most? Mm. People breaking out of the traditional mold of um, big box healthcare and going out on their own and starting practices to help people the way they want to help people. What's a book every physical therapist should read? Digital minimalism. Uh, Cal Newport. Yeah. What's the most underrated skill in physical therapy? Interpersonal relationships. And what's the biggest misconception people have about physical therapy? Hmm. <clears throat> hmm. That's a good one. Uh, you stumped me. The biggest misconception I would say is that you have to wait till there's a problem to seek out help. And finally, what's your number one tip for building patient trust? Listening. Perfect. All right, Michael, last thing we do every time on the show is called the parting shot. Your last time, your last chance for a, you know, mic drop moment, a soapbox statement. What would you want to leave with people? I would say um, we all have passions that first, you know, might be a specific patient population. Um, it, it might be wanting to start a practice. It might be wanting to start a podcast. It might be wanting to start a YouTube channel. You, sh you can and should do all those things, especially if you know that there's a specific person out there that you want to help. Because we, as physical therapists, we should be good communicators. Um, 
And I would say communicate as many ways as you can to educate people. And don't be afraid because I guarantee you someone who's really good at it has been afraid too. Absolutely. Yeah. I communicate often, but uh, always the novice, never the master. Michael Howen, appreciate you coming uh, on the show. They say the best conversation yeah. happened at happy hour. Thanks for coming to ours. I appreciate you having me on. I Thanks for the invite.